Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at leak code number 198, known as House Robber. Now, this is actually a very popular problem that's asked at a lot of companies. Some of these companies include Google, Amazon, Adobe, and many more. Now an important thing to note is a few years ago this problem was actually an easy problem but nowadays is marked as a medium problem. Regardless of the difficulty, one of the reasons why I like this problem so much is because I feel it's a great introduction into dynamic programming. The problem itself is pretty straightforward, so hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have a better understanding of dynamic programming. In any case, let's look at what the problem is asking us to do. So essentially we're given an array called nums, which contains houses. Each index is a house, and in these houses we have some monetary value, or money stashed. And our goal as a house robber is to, well, rob houses. And so initially you might be thinking, well, if we want to maximize the amount of money we can steal, why not just rob all the houses? Well, that's where the problem's constraint comes in. You see, if you rob a house, let's just say the first one right here, you cannot rob the neighboring house. And the reason for this is because if you do that, if you rob a house and then rob the house right next to it, you will trigger an alarm, which contacts the police. So in order to avoid arousing suspicion, if you rob a house, then you cannot rob the next one. So if you want to rob another house, you'll have to rob the house two doors down, in this case, three. So again, starting with our first house, if we rob this one, then we cannot rob this one. Instead, we would have to rob this one as our next house. But here's the thing. If we're looking at our first house, we can always make the choice not to rob it. Instead, we can move to the next house right here and rob that one instead. Again, the same rules apply. If we rob this one, then we cannot rob three. So then next we could rob this. Notice how this problem basically boils down to two decisions. We either choose to rob a house or we skip it. And that's really important to understand because at every house we stop at, we can either make one of those two choices. So to help you understand this, let's draw out a decision tree for this problem. So if we start at the first index and make the choice to rob it, that sets us down a path. So we rob this house for one. Now what else can we do? Well, we've robbed this house, so we cannot rob the next one. We'd have to look over here. Robbing this house nets us three. So we would net three. But here's the interesting thing. I didn't mention this before, but if we decide to rob this one, we don't have to just rob this one. We can also choose to rob this one. Because remember, at every house that we can rob, we can either choose to rob it or not to rob it. So starting from here, obviously we cannot rob this one because we would set off the alarm. So that leaves us these two. So we can either choose to rob this one or we can actually choose to rob this one. And so that splits our decision tree because from one, we can either go to three or we can rob the house at index three to net us another one. So then we can break off and net one. But now bringing it back to the beginning, remember, we start here, but we don't have to rob this. We can start by robbing this house. So then that leads to another path on our decision tree. So we can go rob this house for two. Now from here, if we decide to rob this house for two, we can never rob this one because they're right next to each other. So the only choice is from here, we can either choose to rob this house or not. In this case, let's say we do rob it, which in that case will add to our decision tree. So then from two, we can net one. So just looking at our problem and adding everything up, if we go right here, we can get a max of four. If we come right here, we can get a max of two. And then if we add all this up, we can get a max of three. And so looking at all these different decisions that we can make, essentially all the different houses that we can rob, then it's pretty clear to see which is the most optimal. If we wanna make the most money, then we need to rob the first house at index zero and the house at index two, one plus three equals four, which as you can see is the max amount that we can get and coincides with the output of the first example. Now, right now, this is a pretty simplistic example, but imagine if our nums array had more houses. So let's add a few more on the end here. So by adding three more houses, this whole decision tree will look a lot more complex. In fact, one of the issues with this approach is that we'll be doing a lot of repeat work because if it wasn't clear, this whole decision tree is what a recursive solution would look like. 
Now, the thing with recursion is that we are exploring every combination of house that we can rob within our nums array, but invariably we will introduce a lot of repeat work. We will recalculate a lot of subproblems. And subproblems are really what I want to focus on here. Because remember, at every house in our array, we have two decisions. We can either rob or not rob. Those are our two choices. And so with our recursive brute force solution, we're exploring the paths that can lead to the maximum amount of loot that we can take from these houses. And so by calculating all the possibilities of houses that we can rob and not rob, we will eventually find the solution. The thing is, we can make our solution a lot more efficient if we didn't do any repeat work, or at least cut back on it as much as possible. So how can we do that? Well, that's where dynamic programming comes in. You see, dynamic programming is a way for us to calculate the optimal solution to a problem by the sum of its subproblems. So in our case, if we want to calculate the max amount of loot that we can steal from these houses, then at each step we can either rob a house or skip it. And the thing here is we can use past subproblems to help us with our decision at the current house. And that's the beauty of dynamic programming. We don't have to go down a bunch of paths and repeat a bunch of work because we can just look at our past solutions or the past subproblems that we solved to calculate our current solution. Let me erase everything I have so far and then we can see how a dynamic programming solution would work with our example. All right, so how would this look if we use dynamic programming? Well, again, remember, if we start at our first house right here, we can either choose to rob it or not rob it. So in our case, let's just say we do rob it, which would mean up until this point, so at this house, the maximum amount that we can possibly rob is one, because this is the only house we've robbed so far. But remember, we always have the option of not robbing this house. So let's say instead we chose to skip this house and look to this one. So the second house will give us a value of two. So if we rob that one, then we will have two. But if we choose to rob this house, we cannot rob this one. Remember, we cannot rob adjacent houses. So to help you understand, let me draw these lines right here. And so what I'm trying to represent with these lines right here is up until this point, the max amount that we can get is one because we're only robbing one house. Up until this point, we have two houses. So we can either choose to rob this one and skip that one, or we can skip this one and rob this one instead. So up until this point, the maximum amount that we can rob from these two houses is obviously two. So now if we look at the third house here, which has a value of three, remember we have two choices. Either we can rob it or not rob it. But remember, since we're using dynamic programming, we have to calculate the maximum amount of loot that we can get up until this point, which will give us three. Now, if we do rob this house, that implicitly means that we didn't rob this one, because again, we cannot rob houses that are adjacent to each other. So if we rob this one, then that implies that we've already robbed this one. So then that would mean it would be three plus one, which equals four. Because if we rob this one, we cannot also get the two from here. We would have to get the one from over here because these houses are not next to each other. Or we can say, we're gonna skip this house and just go with the maximum value up until that point. So the maximum value between these two is two. So in looking at this house, we have two choices. We can either accept two or we can do three plus one. Now, obviously looking at this, four is greater than two. And so the max amount that we can possibly rob up until this point is four. All right, and finally we come to our final house, which has a value of one. So again, we can either choose to rob it or skip it. In the event that we choose to rob it, that means that we cannot get the value from this index because the houses are right next to each other. So that means should we choose to rob this house, then that means we can choose the maximum amount of loot that we robbed from these two houses. Now obviously between these two houses, two is the greater number. So that means our calculation would be one plus two equals three. And just for clarification, this one is referring to this one, not this one. So if we choose to rob this house, we can look at our past values of the houses that we robbed up until this point, because we cannot rob adjacent houses. So between these two houses that we robbed, this one yields the most amount of money. So obviously we're going to want to go with this one, which is how we get three. So again, up until this point, if we choose to rob this house, the maximum amount that we can rob in total would be one plus two for a total of three. Otherwise, if we choose to skip this house, that means we can just pull over the number that we have here because this is the maximum amount that we've robbed so far. 
And of course, the maximum amount of four is greater than three, which means up until this point in our nums array, four is the maximum amount that we can rob from all these houses. And this is essentially dynamic programming in action. Notice how all this doesn't need to be stored in an auxiliary array. We can just incrementally build up our answer and then just look at past answers to determine our decision at the current house. Now, before we jump in the code, I wanna calculate the runtime and space complexity. So our runtime is going to be O of N. And the reason for this is because since we're looking at past data to inform our current decision, we can actually do this entire problem in one pass. And so because of that, we'll be looking at upwards of N items, hence why we have a runtime of O of N. Now I will say that we will be making use of the max function. So max essentially just compares two numbers and then returns the maximum value. But that has a constant time complexity, so that doesn't really hinder our runtime in any way. So the final runtime is just O of N. And then our space complexity is going to be O of one or constant time. And the reason for this is just simply because we don't have any auxiliary data structures. Again, this problem is done just using the information we have in the array and just incrementally building up our answer until we arrive at the final solution. So it's not necessary to use a data structure for this problem. Although there are solutions that do make use of a data structure, ours isn't using one. All right, so now let's jump into the code. All right, so the first thing we have to do is initialize two variables. Remember, the current house that we're looking at is made by looking at previous data. So when looking at a house, we can either choose to get the max value of the previous house that wasn't robbed or get the max value of the previous house that was robbed. And so the way we can denote that is just by simply having two variables called prev no rob and prev robbed. And these will both start at zero because when we start out, obviously we haven't robbed anything, so they'll just be zero. So to recap, this variable means the max amount of the previous house that wasn't robbed. And this one means the max amount of the previous house that was robbed. Now that we have our two variables, we can use those variables to incrementally build up to our final solution. So all we have to do now is just iterate through our nums array. So we can start with for cur house value in nums. And so one of the first considerations we wanna make is to get the max of either prev no rob or prev robbed, because we always wanna keep track of the max amount that we have robbed up to that point. And so we can get that information by checking the max value between prev no rob and prev robbed. So for now, we can just store this in a temp variable and calculate the max between the two variables. Prev no rob and prev robbed. So temp will always hold the max value up until that point, up until our current house that we're looking at. So once we have that information, we can update our variables so we can continue the process as we move through our array. So first let's update prev robbed, which is simply updated to the sum of prev no rob plus the current house value. This is because we can only rob the current house if the previous one was not robbed. So this is how we update this variable. And then finally we have to update prev no rob. And so this will store the temp variable that we calculated up here, which again, the purpose of this temp variable is to track the maximum amount that we can get by either robbing house or not robbing it. Because if we choose not to rob the current house that we're looking at, then the maximum amount is either the best of either not robbing the previous house or robbing it. And so now that we have both of these updated, this loop will just continue until we reach the end of our nums array, at which point we can break out of this for loop and then return the max of prev no rob or prev rob. So again, the last check here is really just to make sure that we're getting the max value between these two variables. So after everything's said and done, we will have our final answer. So let me run the solution to see if it works. All right, so that's gonna do it for this video. Hope you guys learned a lot, and I really hope dynamic programming makes more sense to you now. In any case, I have a lot more coding videos like this, so check those out if you haven't, and I'll see you guys in the next video.